Welcome to the Schools of Excellence podcast, a place for insightful conversations about building sustainable schools of excellence. Join me each week as we explore the importance of leading with your values, creating impact, and leaving a lasting legacy. My goal on the show is to provide you with clarity, elevate your mindset, and equip you with practical strategies and inspiration. I'm Fanny Olszanski, a proud mother of four, a former New Yorker, and now savoring sunny Florida vibes. With a professional journey spanning 18 years across all levels of school leadership, I bring nuanced insight that delves into the intricate details of running a center, as well as the broader visionary aspects of leadership. Thank you for joining me for this conversation. Let's build a legacy of excellence together. Hey everyone, welcome back to the ECE Forecast 2024 ECE Forecast, where we are pioneering a new era of school leadership. So last week's episode, if you didn't get a chance to listen, pause this episode and go back and listen to the previous one because each episode builds on the next one. And so this entire series of the ECE forecast is about having conversation on what the new era of school leadership and the 2024 forecast is going to look like. And I specifically chose four key buckets of where I see the landscape of those buckets changing so much in this new era. And that's leadership, parent partnerships, child relationships, and financials. And so last week, I really dove into leadership and how leadership needs to evolve and change as we enter this new era. And so today's conversation is going to be about parent partnerships. So let's dive in. So What is really changing in the realm of parent partnerships? Well, in recent years, parent expectations have really evolved significantly. So parents today have way higher expectations for their children's education. And a lot of that is really influenced by increased awareness of educational standards, a desire for just like trying to control and create the best possible outcomes for their child. And this real heightened expectation really has resulted in increased demands on teachers and staff. And so parents are trying to control the uncontrollable. They are trying to control factors and uh, components of their child's development and components of their child's life's journey that are not controllable by them. This is we are um, environment, nature versus nurture, and then learning how to trust and have faith that they're going to do the best that they can and they are still going to mess up and they are still going to make mistakes and they are still going to leave an imprint on their child that their child might have to work through later on in life. And that lack of acceptance of understanding that you cannot protect your kid from every single danger, nor is that your job, that heightened level of anxiety is really filtering into the communication and partnerships that we are trying to create with families. And that high level of anxiety is really impacting our staff. Where else are we seeing a change or kind of a divergence in parent partnerships? We're seeing that in economic and social pressures. So economic and social pressures are really driving parents to seek some sort of stability and assurance about their child's educational experiences. So whether that is um, the educational route that they want to take, the academic rigor, the sports, the social dynamics, they are taking a very different approach to how they are handling um, their child's education. And as the world becomes more and more competitive and uncertain, parents feel the sense of urgency of like, how do I give my child the best possible chances? And what's happening is the economic and social pressures are manifesting themselves in very demanding, um, very like unrealistic behavior and expectation. And so when someone's anxiety is so high, we all know this, like when you're in a level of survival, um, little things that really shouldn't be bothering you are creating a massive heightened level of anxiety. So I'll see parents like go crazy on a teacher who lost their child's black ponytail. And a black ponytail costs a fraction of a penny inside of Walmart when you're buying five, you know, 25 ponytails that cost $2.99. One ponytail costs a penny, less than a penny, and they're freaking out that you lost their child's ponytail. Um, or they're having a panic attack that their child had an accident, like not understanding that having an accident and peeing your pants is part of 
toilet training in the toddler and threes classrooms. And so because there's been such a different uh, conversation, different expectation on child development, which we'll talk about in the next episode, um, and how child development has really changed because of the pandemic and the lockdowns and just all the different regulations. So parents are really shifting how they're looking at their child's development. And so they are becoming so anxious for themselves of like their own dreams, their own desires, their own hopes, their own aspirations for their kids. And they're like, oh my gosh, like how am I going to make this all happen? You're my child's teacher. Like you need to do all these things for my kid. And so that is really causing massive pressure on not only the owners and the directors and like the people in administration and leadership, the staff, like the teachers, the assistant teachers are like, what is going on here? And they're feeling it. Another component that's really impacting parent relationships is the digital age. It has really brought in so many new challenges, also brought in opportunities. But because parents have this unprecedented level of access to information about educational practices, and they can easily communicate, right? There's like 15 different ways that parents could get access to you now, right? Besides like email, text, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, whatever it is, then there's also like the apps that you create and like the different, all those different levels of communication. There's so many ways that parents could reach you. So many different ways. Um, and they are they have access to so much information. And so it's so easy for them now to ping you and communicate with you. And so while this connectivity can feel positive, it also leads to an increased interaction and expectation that really can become highly burdensome for you. And it's it's not sustainable to to manage that level of um, connection and expectation and demand that's coming from outside forces. So what I want to do here is I actually want to give you a little bit of insight into a conversation that Esther Perel led at the South by Southwest conference in 2023. So Esther Perel is a leading relationship and intimacy expert. She's a psychotherapist. Her practice is based out of New York City. She's written multiple books. She also has um, a game, a card game called Where Should We Begin? If you've followed my work for any time, you know that I quote Esther a lot because I really value the wisdom and experience that I believe she brings to the table. And so what I want to share here with you are two small excerpts from that speech, uh, from that keynote that she gave. And in this short excerpt here, Esther talks about how relationships are shifting what power viewing mental health. And one of the biggest things she talks about is how modern loneliness is impacting relationships. So let's take a listen here. I've been thinking a lot about modern loneliness, which masks itself as hyperconnectivity. Modern loneliness, which masks itself as hyperconnectivity. How can we have a thousand virtual friends and then no one to ask to feed our cat? How can we develop deep bonds with our coworkers on Slack or see them in their homes on Zoom without ever meeting them in real life? And how we think that we know the lives of others because of what they post, but how we truly have no idea. We live in a world of curated, filtered imagery that puts us in a constant state of social comparison and self-esteem has become contingent on performance. Performance that is measured by engagement metrics. Did I get enough likes? Is the rise of therapy speak on apps like TikTok helping us to address this, I ask? Or is it simply creating a cacophony of self-diagnosis? We know that online communities can be extremely gratifying. They give us education, belonging, friendships, connections, and a lot to laugh at. But we also know that youngsters today are online all day. And research consistently shows it's creating unprecedented anxiety and depression, particularly for girls, and isolation and decreased social skills for boys. And we wonder why there is a growing mental health crisis? Or for that matter, I've been thinking, are we really in a mental health crisis? 
or are we having adaptive responses to the crisis and the malaise of the societies and the world that we live in? Most likely, it is both. These are just some of the questions that I have been preoccupied with in recent years. Another thing that is impacting paired relationships is fear and anxiety. So in an era that has been marked by so many global changes, parents have experienced a crazy level of fear and anxiety of their children's future. I mean, I go sometimes into different Facebook groups or I see certain threads and the conversations that happen in there like really frighten me sometimes. Like people will actually be talking there and saying things like, you know, this is why I don't want to bring kids into the world. This is why I don't want to have kids. I don't want to bring kids into this crazy world. I don't want to, you know, bring children into what's happening inside of this environment. And that feels like, wow, that's heavy. Like that is heavy for people to be looking at the world around them and saying, I don't want to bring kids into this world. And the parents, the people that have chosen to have children, that do have kids, that are raising children in this era, um, while they have children and they've chosen, you know, they've made that choice, but are also looking around and saying, what is going to be with my kids? Like, what is going to be here? What is happening? And a lot of that fear can lead to a sense of urgency and this like desire for these instant results and instant outcomes from the educational institutions that they're sending their kids to. And what happens is, is like the parents are expecting these like instant results. And it's like your kid is three, like he has an entire journey of life ahead of him or five or six or even if he's 15, like these these moments are a blip on the radar of like their entire life's journey. But because fear and anxiety, when we're feeling it inside of us, it drives our urgency and our like emotional decision making as opposed to like making decisions from a level of high cognition um, and mental acuity. We're not doing that and parents are not doing that. And so they're coming into our schools and having conversations with our leadership team and our staff and they're like, you need to do this now. And it's like, no, like that is something that takes several years actually to develop inside of a child. Um, and also uh, the brain is not fully developed until you are 26 years old. And so your child is six. He has 20 more years of his brain developing. But the urgency, the rush, that thing, that emotion is driving far too many decisions the way that we're looking at parent relationships. Where else are parent partnerships being impacted? Teachers and staff are internalizing the parent issues as personal attacks. So parents are coming in, they're saying things like, I need this, I need that, you didn't do this, this didn't happen, that whatever complaints are bringing, we don't have to highlight those, you know what they are. And teachers are internalizing them as personal attacks. And so the increased demands of these confrontations with parents le really leads the staff to question their own talent, their own education, their own integrity. And the emotional impact is becoming really demoralizing on our teams and really contributing to feelings of shame and inadequacy. So I want to pause here for a second. I want to kind of rephrase this in a different way because I think this is really important to understand. When, par when teachers or you or anyone in your leadership team internalizes parent issues, parent struggles, parent demands as personal attacks, you can begin to question whether you're good enough for the job, whether you're good enough to do this. When you start to question that, it is a slow roll for demoralizing the company culture. And when you feel feelings of shame and inadequacy, the way that you respond and react to challenges that are coming at you are very different than when you operate from a place of wholeness and a place of good enough. <coughs> and so it's very easy for us to say something like, well, don't take it personally. You know, don't take personally what the parent says or whatever it is. But we, we know that doesn't, you know, work. 
we can't just tell our staff, don't take it personally. We can't just tell our staff, uh, the parents don't mean it. They're under a lot of stress or whatever it is, because guess what? They're also under a lot of stress. And when you lead, like I was saying in the previous episode, when you lead from a place of um, just wanting to tell people what to do, that leadership is not enough. People have been through too much. You can't just lead from that place. It doesn't work. It really just doesn't work. So how is this impacting turnover? So when teachers and staff feel this level of overwhelm and unsupport, it leads to emotional distress from demanding parents, right? So you can have like the most well-meaning people in the world. Like I love Mayor and Mayor and I have an amazing relationship. And then sometimes we still say things that are counterintuitive and really not helpful to our partners, right? In moments of our own distress, right? So when you're witnessing someone's distress and you're like, oh my gosh, like just calm down for a second, right? Because it's making you feel more distressed. This is one of the hard parts about leading young kids and leading kids that are in general just unregulated. And we'll talk about that in the next episode. But the the most well-meaning and well-intentioned people when we're surrounded by them sometimes tell us the wrong things. And that's inevitable. And that's part of life. Um, and this episode is not about, oh, and now implement this in this playbook and this in this strategy, and you'll no longer say things that will hurt people. That's bullshit. Like, when you are in long-term relationships with human beings, you are going to sometimes say things that are hurtful and that are, you know, unkind to the person that you love dearly and respect dearly. And that is the power of repair, which we'll talk about in the next episode. And so what happens here in par parent partnerships is we look at things and we say something like, well, you know, if the parents really respected us or the parents really valued us or the parents, whatever it is, they wouldn't say things like that. Okay, you can believe that. Or you can pause and say, how am I internalizing this in this moment? What is the story I'm telling myself about this? Like, how do I navigate this a little bit differently? And the reason why we have to ask that different question is because when we're not, it's leading to turnover rates because staff are seeking positions and environments where they don't have to manage this level of stress. And again, it could sometimes feel a little bit like running away from things. We are, you know, the staff is like, I have all this stress or whatever. It's like, I want a job that doesn't have any stress. And I'm like, okay, but, but, but that's not what this is, right? Or I want a better job that doesn't have as much uncertainty or, or you know, or any of that kind of stuff. When we don't recognize that like uncertainty is a fact of life. So I want to share here with you another clip from Esther where she talks about how modern conveniences, while they're really amazing, they've really impacted our relationships in ways that we're not even fully aware of. And when we can understand that how these modern conveniences impact us, impact our decision making, impacting our thought process, we can better go into the parent partnerships and the relationships that we want to build with families from a better understanding of where they're coming from. So let's take a listen into that. It's like I have entered a form of assisted living. My calendar pings me with my next meeting. Waze tells me which road to take. Spotify tells me what to listen to next. Netflix tells me what to watch. If I was single, I'd probably be on a dating app. But let's be honest, I'm still late. I will always get massively lost. My husband and I now talk the entire evening about which movie to watch, but we'll end up watching none, you know, because there's too much choice. And the dating apps, even 65% of relationships, you know, now start online, but it's also the number one thing that people complain to me about. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy my inconveniences being removed. But at the same time, being uncomfortable, doing things that you end up not enjoying, being afraid and taking risks are some of the ways that we learn who we are and who we are not. The experimentations and the failures are essential to the development of our identity. 
And you would think that having all these recommendations in the palm of our hand would make us more confident, less anxious, more prepared for what we call in French l'inconnu, the unknowable. But what if they are eroding us? When we take the risks away, we take away the learning opportunities. We create rigidity in a world that demands flexibility. We develop a constant need for certainty when facing uncertainty has always been a fact of life, something that many of you in this room know very well. And as my colleague Theodora Pavkovic explains, it's our ability to act freely upon the uncertainty and then see the ripples of our own actions that lets us know that we are alive. Our increasingly predictive technologies, while they have solved many of life's biggest inconveniences, are also making us unprepared and unable to tolerate the inevitable unpredictabilities of human nature, love and life. They promise to eliminate friction, to smooth the rough edges. We've all been stroking these phones, we know what I'm talking about. But I do fear that we may be smoothing life's rough edges to the point of flatness. So now I want to kind of ch- like shift the conversation into addressing some of the key areas of focus that you want to have in 2024 and beyond as we look into this new era of leadership. So this is not a new concept of parent engagement, right? Every school leader knows that we need to engage with families. We need to, you know, connect with them. We need to build relationships. And I think the first thing that I want to invite you guys to look at as you enter this new era is what are going to be the clear channels for addressing concerns and expectations? So there's, again, so many channels and so many ways to communicate with the staff, with you, with the office, with the front of house, like all of those things. In 2024, I want you to get really clear on what is the channel, what are the channels, the ways that parents can address concerns and expectations. You need to educate your families how to come to you with concerns and expectations. Because what's happening is, is parents are coming with concerns and expectations at morning drop-off, at pickup, in the middle of the day, texting this, doing this. Like There's so many different ways that parents are dumping their emotions Um, or as I call it, you know, verbal vomiting over your staff and leadership team. And that like breach of boundaries is what's making it so much more difficult for the staff to be able to manage the demand that's coming at them. So again, this is not about how do we get the parents to make less demands of us. This is about how do we create better channels for parents to communicate what it is that's on their mind and what's going on. Because again, like I just shared a couple minutes ago, we're in a new era of parent partnerships. We're in a new era of parenting, of regulation, of conversation. And so it's we, we can't ask the same questions. We have to ask different questions. So stop asking the question, how do I get my teachers to not take it personally? And how do I get the parents to complain less? And let's ask a different question. Let's ask a question of how do we establish clear channels for addressing concerns and expectations? Let's go a little bit further. When parents are bringing these concerns, these expectations, these demands, and many of them are crazy unrealistic. Some of them are very realistic and manageable and fixable and we could take care of them. And some of them are like, what? Like, what planet are you coming from? Like, which world have you been dropped into? And so educating and training our staff how to manage emotional distress from the parents is key to helping teachers and your leadership team stay sturdy and regulated and calm in those moments. So I have a whole training on distress tolerance um, that I've done for many, many schools. And if you're interested in our distress tolerance training, please email us. Um, or send us a message or all the million other ways that you could get a hold of us. All the links are in the show notes. Um, and you can find out more information on our leadership days on how we really support staff and how to manage their emotional distress better with families. 
Another area that I want to address here in 2024 and beyond and how you can really foster better partner, better parent partnerships is creating a parent partnership system. So we all know that we need to create emotional currency in relationships. So when you are entering any kind of relationship, you can't just take out of the relationship. You need to pour into a relationship. And you know that with your own kids, you have to build that relationship, that emotional reciprocity, that just emotional currency inside of the bank. And I have a whole podcast episode, episode three on this podcast called The Gratitude Matrix. And this is where we're learning how to build emotional relationships with our staff. So parent partnerships are very similar. And inside of our Directors Inner Circle and our Owners HQ program, we actually have a whole framework called the Parent Partnership Blueprint, which is an entire blueprint on how to consistently build emotional currency with families. Because when parents feel that they have a partnership with the teacher, that they have this relationship with them, they complain less. They bring less challenges to you. Less things bother them, right? So think about yourself when your cup is full, when you are feeling good, when you are well taken care of, when your needs are being met, pointless things are pointless. They don't bother you. And so if we look at the framework that I've been sharing until now, where we have increased parent expectations, economic and social pressures, digital age challenges, fear and anxiety, all of these things that parents are coming with, if we can bridge it and create emotional currency with the families, they understand that we truly love their kids and we have their best interest in mind. This is something that I started doing back in 2009. So this is going back over a decade ago where I created the parent partnership blueprint when I was a teacher. And then I ended up teaching it to my staff when I moved into positions of leadership and management. And the parent partnership blueprint is a simple framework and understanding. How do I pour into these families? How do I communicate to staff that to the families that we love their kid, that we know their child, we see them, we hear them, we validate them. And so if you're interested in that framework and you want to learn more about our parent partnership blueprint, um, click the link in the show notes and we can have a conversation about our owners HQ and directors in our circle and see if you're a good fit for the program. So where else can we look at the next era of leadership and how parent partnerships are going to be impacted in this coming year and beyond? Conflict resolution, when I look at the amount of con things that parents are turning into conflicts, is really unprecedented in a lot of ways. And knowing how to lead difficult conversations and conflict management with families um, will really empower your staff to not feel helpless in the realm of like, oh my gosh, like this parent came again, this parent came again. And what we have to remember also is teachers, especially veterans, feel a lot of shame and inadequacy in coming to leadership and asking for help in dealing with parents. So when, and especially veterans, like this, this conversation is for veterans, not just for the young staff um, and the new teachers. When veterans are used to a particular way of engaging with parents, of having conversation with parents, of calming their fears, of engaging with them, of building emotional currency, of all their stuff that have worked until now. And then they come into this new era as we head into 2024 and beyond. And they're like, this isn't working. Like this, like no matter what I do, this parent isn't staying, you know, isn't indeed or still is still coming down hard on me or whatever it is. The veteran teacher has so much shame around coming to leadership or even their own colleagues. Right. That asking for help is not just about level like questioning up. It's also about turning to the peers alongside you. Um, because they feel like, well, I'm supposed to know what to do, right? Um, or I'm the mentor teacher, like everyone's asking me for help or whatever it is. And we need to remember, like, just because you mentor other people, it doesn't mean that you don't need help. It doesn't mean that you have the answers to everything. It doesn't mean that you, you know, un like, don't, just don't need support. Of course you do. So as you enter this new year, I invite you to please 
lead one-on-ones with your veteran teachers and explain to them this. Have them listen to this podcast. Explain and educate how parents are changing and evolving and why it is so critical for them to, when they see certain things, not see it as, I'm not a good enough teacher. I don't know how to do this with these parents. But an invitation to, I need to go get some wise counsel. I need to go ask some other people if they have some insight that they can help me with over here. So by recognizing these changing dynamics of parents and educators and how schools really can come in together, we can really reduce staff turnover that's connected to parent partnerships. But more than anything, the parents are a huge stakeholder in how education is going to consistently work and evolve in the next year and beyond. And so forging those powerful parent partnerships, building those relationships are going to be key to empowering you and empowering your staff to feel like they have the confidence, the steadiness, and the sturdiness to enter those conversations. So thanks so much for joining me for this second episode. So far, we've done leadership and parent partnerships. And next week, we'll dive into child relationships. If you are loving the Schools of Excellence podcast and have gotten any value out of it for your school and for yourself, I would love if you could do two things for me. One, subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. And two, can you please leave us a review? Reviews help other school leaders know that this is the podcast to learn about building a school of excellence. And I'd be so grateful if you can do that for us. Your help and support make this show be able to listen to by thousands of other school leaders around the globe. Thanks so much for listening and giving us your time and attention each week.